All right. Well, welcome, folks. Uh, thank you for sharing part of your Friday with us. Um, we're happy to present this webinar, and which can also be used as uh, CME for those of you that are mediators with us. Um, this is the Mediator's Notebook, which becomes the Attorney's Toolbox. So we're pleased here at Upchurch Watson, White & Max to have these presentations on a continuing basis and complementary basis with our partner at the University of Florida Levin College of Law, the Institute for Dispute Resolution. So I've been doing these for years together, and uh, if you happen not to make it all the way through, the recordings are usually available on our website. Um, so welcome today. Um, Bart and I are pleased to work together at, uh, at UpChurch. I'm sorry, I'm advancing slides. Uh, and uh, we have different perspectives on the mediation profession, but we're bringing those together today, and it's really Art's show. I'm just here to chime in and uh, keep the program rolling. But Art, why don't you take a minute and tell folks about yourself? All right, great. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Uh, and I think it's our show, and uh, thanks to UpChurch. Watson, White and & Max, and the University of Florida for putting this uh, program uh, and availability to us. Uh, I, I am a uh, full-time mediator and arbitrator with, uh, with the firm. I've been doing this full-time now for um, in my fifth year. Uh, background was uh, I was a civil litigator and trial attorney for the better part of 26 years, full-time active. Uh, did some things before that. I was a Registered nurse, I worked over at the University of Miami Jackson Vernon Trauma Centers and some other facilities around the state. I was an EMT in Florida and North Carolina, and I did a, uh, a stint in the Marine Corps where I, uh, I left uh, as a sergeant. I was in aviation. So I also did civil trial law for a couple of decades. I became a mediator in 2001, and um, back then you had to be a lawyer five years to get certified. I did that right away and then started doing it sort of out the back door and then um, became an arbitrator in 2005 and then in 2010 jumped in full time and uh, have been pleased to be here at the firm since 2014. And I do a sort of federal, state and appellate stuff, but I focus in three main areas, which really is the torts and the commercial world and the intellectual property cases. So. I have sort of uh, three constituencies that like to use me and uh, seen it all. And we're going to try to share with you folks today um, our joint experience in this field. So what is it that we do, Art? All right. Well, that's a good question. Um, it's taken me five years to kind of figure that out and it's starting to come together. Um, you know, I, I wrote down the other day a little bit uh, of what I thought about it. It's kind of how this program got built. Um, you know, sometimes the way I think about it is it's kind of like the parties come to mediation and they're going to do a dance. Uh, you know, it's a bit of a cautious dance. Um, you know, there's a lot of gamesmanship and, you know, as the mediator, uh, you know, we're kind of the observers. Participants don't always seem to know that they're doing it, uh, what they're doing. And, you know, uh, as the mediator, sometimes I feel like our job is to make sure that you know, they're not dancing with two left feet and stepping on each other's toes. We can't settle anything, but we can kind of make sure they don't impasse or blow it up inadvertently. You think sometimes a case is going to settle whatever whatever happens, that, it, that some cases on a course to uh, resolution and despite the left feet or what we try to do that uh, we just don't want to get in the way? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, from a mediator's perspective, sometimes and you may have had, I'd like to know if you've had the same experience. Sometimes we kind of see where things are going early on, but the, but the participants don't. You would think it's clear, but it's it's not. And they have to kind of go through this process and uh, you know, feel like we're kind of guiding them through, uh, helping them work it so that they don't make a mistake or do something that's going to take them in the wrong direction. I think as the, as the mediator, I find that we've I certainly have learned over the years that I have to be very nimble, make a lot of adjustments, be a little bit of a legal scholar, a lot of therapist, um, and a bit of a peacemaker, uh, just to kind of keep the keep the process moving and keep people talking. To me, that's the big thing. As long as people are talking, we're actually in the process and we have a chance. That is key. Let me advance to your next one. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my sensitive MacBook today. So as an attorney, 
um, looking at the process? What are what are the goals there? Yeah, well, you know, the goals for the attorneys, and and I think that uh, you know the the big goal coming out of the box oftentimes is you know well, we're here to settle. Um, but it's not really always I, from the mediator's perspective. I see it as you know the attorney thinks that may be the main goal, but it turns out it may not be the only goal, or it may not be the goal that's going to be there for the day. Sometimes uh, you get into the discussions and the process is moving along, and you you realize you know maybe we're not going to really get resolved, but you know is today the day that we can lay the groundwork for some ongoing discussions through messaging? Um, you know, can we discover you know what will it take to to get the job done, is there anything that's missing? Uh, can we assess and evaluate? And see, I, I go back to, uh, is it up there on number five? You know, be willing to reevaluate and adjust. I, I have up there, you know, like the nursing process. Well, that is my background. I was a registered nurse in, in burns and trauma. And, you know, the nursing process, as we're taught, is really something to be utilized in, in all walks of life. And I find it very helpful in mediation, which is, you know, it's an assessment, it's a diagnosis, planning, implementation, and evaluation. So once I get a sense of the attorney's goals or help them figure out what their goals are, then we can we can go through that process, you know, assess where we're at. Uh, are we going to get there? What's the plan? How are you going to learn it? Let's go and implement that. Let's take it to the other side. Let's get the discussion going and then evaluate. How are we doing? Are we getting anywhere? Are we making progress? And then it, it, it cycles back. It comes back to the beginning. And I think throughout a mediation, especially long mediations, you really kind of constantly have to be moving through there. Otherwise, you really end up just carrying numbers back and forth. And I know that you and I are, uh, that, that's not how we like to mediate. No, and that's not how the attorneys like it either, right? So no. I guess in carrying those messages, um, are you prospectively, um, dropping uh, hints of ranges? Are you uh, looking at non-monetary outcomes that could help to move things along and the interests are more along some kind of solution that yes, might have a cost to it, but it's really um, something that a, a court couldn't fashion. Um, what what types of, of messaging do you find yourself going in your day to day? Yeah, uh, you know, good question because you know, and everybody, every mediator is different. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with mediators about do you uh, do you suggest numbers? Do you introduce the concept of brackets, or do you wait for them? And we'll talk in more detail about that in a little while. I tend to be a bit proactive, and I like to put things out in front of people and suggest different ideas. And, Ask them, you know, if we did this or that, you know, let's talk about what kind of response you think you'll get. Uh, Non-monetary terms, especially I do, I do a lot of tort work. Um, I do, I do some commercial, um, and the non-monetary terms sometimes are the first things that have to be overcome. There could be special release language that needs to be worked on, because, uh, and, and particularly to say about that, you don't want to get to the end of the case where we've all worked out the numbers and then say, okay, now there's one more thing and it's a big non-monetary term and it's material and we start all over again or it breaks down. So I do find out on cases, are there going to be such terms, things that we need to consider? And sometimes if you get bogged down, say you get bogged down on the numbers, it is really helpful to change the conversation for a while and see if you can get something else worked out and then you come back to what you're having trouble with. That creates momentum if that answers the question a little bit. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think uh, sometimes, you know, you get down the road a bit, things are stalling. If you refocus onto another issue that isn't about money, um, it tends to grease the wheels a little bit. Now, it could go the opposite way and have people start over lawyering uh, indemnity language or lease language or something. Um, but I, I do find uh, with cases where that stuff is likely to come up, um, addressing it before the very end is probably the better policy. Um, and I, you know, I rarely get, uh, unless it's some complex case that involves licensing or something, really get a, a sketch of what the parties um, want the agreement to look like in advance. Um, and it used to be it happened more. It used to be that we got summaries and things more in advance than we do. Uh, and despite some of the case management orders and things that state, you know, 
provide the mediator or something within 10 days of mediation. I don't see um, that improving uh, much in the last few years. I know lawyers are busy running from fire to fire, case to case, and it is tough to get those things out. Um, and, you know, even if it's the last thing that was filed, a summary judgment motion, something that gives us um, more of an idea. Otherwise, what we're doing is kind of poking around the dockets and figuring out the activity level of the case and kind of who's um, got the last thing, last win and what hearings next that poses a risk to the parties and those kind of things. Um, but it still helps if, if we get a little bit of a heads up. And I know you and I are both proactive about calling parties, but you don't always get through to the, the council. Nowadays, everybody's right. working here and there. They're not sitting at their desk. And so, um, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good point. What you just said about being proactive, I, I am. I'm, I'm a preparing, I, I like to prepare. I don't like to go into a mediation cold and I don't always get, I do get some uh, materials at times. I don't get it as often as you would think. Uh, I used to call uh, the lawyers almost always. Um, and one thing I discovered was that I could hear the anxiety in their voice because they were still, they're not ready. They're, they're trying to get ready and I'm asking them questions and I was creating stress. So part of what I do now is as part of my pre-mediation preparation, I do review the docket and the pleadings to go and look for the things that you just said. I look for when, you know, when was the action filed? Is there a trial date? Has there been a case management conference? Is there one coming up? proposals for settlement, uh, motions for summary judgment, anything that I can read to give me as much data as possible so then I can plan the right. mediation and think about how am I going to handle this process, what's going to be in front of me. Yeah, I think I think it's it's helpful to have uh, the history of, of the action. But, you know, there's some cases where uh, the parties have purposefully not taking depositions and not engaged in heavy discovery other than maybe paper and you know are trying to be uh, judicious and conserve resources because uh, perhaps there's just not a lot at stake and the cost of litigation might outweigh uh, the amount in controversy or there's no fee provision or something driving it like that so um, it is helpful when those cases arise to have you know, a, a nice little conversation with each side, and and get, and I think there's still some misimpression that like people can't talk to us. I mean, we're not judges, and we have our confidentiality, and we you know respect uh, boundaries. And I think uh, I don't know. Don't be intimidated, folks, to call your mediator and lean on them as to uh, what you want to see happen, and also you know let me tell you uh, there are two sides to the story, and let's try to. Also, you know, figure out what's going to be said by the other if I don't reach them before mediation. Sometimes with the Zoom thing, I've been, you know, letting the party that I didn't talk to yet in first talk to them for a few minutes. So I don't have um, just the one side perspective. And, you know, I might not get that at opening either. Um, and then sometimes, you know, the attorneys will show up early without their clients and I'll learn about, you know, what what's their client's perspective and are they having a disagreement in the valuation of the case? Because there's sometimes, right, the mini mediation between lawyer and client over expectations. And yeah, right. Yeah, that, that's 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 an interesting point. Uh, first, the, what's not in the docket or what you don't see can be as important as what is it's just like uh, I, I won't see a lot of uh, cancellations of discovery and depositions once the mediation is noticed and it, it tells me that. Maybe they just want to get to the discussion and not spend any more money, uh, and that's important. And also, what you just said is is something I've really figured out over the years. The the mediation, the negotiation is is really just between uh, plaintiff and defendant. It's it's plaintiff's lawyer with plaintiff and defense lawyers with adjusters, and everybody's negotiating with the mediator. It seems so. You kind of have to have your your radar up and know really what what the dynamics are. So it makes it interesting. Well, mediation is interesting. I do find that uh, that's why I love what I do. All right. So let's see what some tools in the toolbox are. All right. Okay. Um, good. Let me jump in here uh, and kind of just reiterate something we said. You know, it's not always about settling. Uh, sometimes it's just about helping the parties, you know, navigate into that path of resolution. You know, knowledge is key. Uh, as we were just discussing for the mediator to know as much about the case. Uh, I think the parties need to know things. I do uh, have instances where you can tell that a participant joins the process and they're really not prepared. 
uh, and it doesn't help things. So knowledge is obtained during the process. It's better if it's provided before, uh, but sometimes we need to learn things in it uh, to, to kind of get to where we need to be. Um, and the language that we use uh, of the process, I'll, I'll say repeatedly, the, the process, uh, it, it has its own code. Um, and sometimes the participants, they're very good trial advocates, but you know, just like we're doing this seminar now, I think the goal of the seminar, part of it is to help create good mediation advocates and understand the language and the process uh, that we work with them, which will make everybody better at the mediation. Agree. I think, um, you know, it, it, it often is frustrating uh, to your first point here, you know, if the case doesn't settle, but there's so much that can be learned in the process. Um, and I'm not just talking about, you know, the proverbial free discovery that goes on, um, right. but, you know, just uh, things you might not have appreciated, uh, perspectives about your own case. Um, I don't know, a witness that you might want to take, um, you know, some little piece uh, of evidence that uh, has yet to materialize or, you know, you have to go uh, hunt down that may make all the difference in in turning the case. Uh, and so I think just paying attention to the file. I mean, I, I remember just, you know, in the trial lawyer days of running around, you have all these busy dockets and you're trying to keep everybody happy. Um, but diving into that file in advance of this process uh, really helps to focus you. And just like it does with trial prep, you know, you really uh, a couple of weeks out from trial and you're starting to go index depots and do all the things you need to do and and you have those little epiphanies right so i think it can be that way with mediation and given that mediation is such a um, you know it's a, a, a narrow event that um, we don't give i think as much importance to um, that it's really the the time when everybody's paying attention um, so whether you have an insured case with with adjusters and uh, folks who are present at the mediation, but folks back in some home office somewhere that have roundtabled the matter, or if it's a commercial case and you have the CFO's attention and they're not um, busy with some daily meeting or something, they're actually paying attention to this case and how much that it's going to cost. And I think that those things, if they're um, given that weight, um, it can be that much more productive and may not settle. But of course, you and I are famous for being persistent and following up with people get those uh, numbers better and try to get the case resolved. But I think that the process itself, if it's given that attention, can be so much more productive. Yeah, interesting, because sometimes, uh, almost like a focus group, we'll be in mediation and one party, one participant is focusing on a fact or a piece of evidence that really wasn't that important to the other. And all of a sudden it's, gee, why is that important? Well, let's explore it. Why, why are they latching on? Or are, is it a red herring? Is it just something that's going to turn out to not be important and somebody is making their evaluation or decision about where they want their case to go on something that in the end might not be there? Kind of like when we did focus group groups as trial lawyers, you know, we'd watch these folks from behind a camera and they'd start talking about something that the lawyers never even spoke about because that's what juries do too. Uh, so, yeah, the process and, you know, a lot of cases, uh, I'll say a fair number of cases, I, I keep a list of cases that I've either adjourned or that I didn't adjourn, they may have been passed, but there's something about it that I know I'm coming back to this and I'll diary, I'll put it in my calendar as a bring up and I'll just kind of reach out to the participants or I'll look at the docket and I'll see what has happened since mediation. Exactly. And just that really can stimulate conversation again. Yeah, and I, I was just re-engaged on a case from uh, November and uh, have my notes handy and, you know, uh, got right back on that train because, yeah, it's just sometimes a, uh, a hearing needs to happen or a depot needs to get taken or, um, you know, somebody needs to feel another legal bill come in <laughs> to get this thing back to the table. Uh, and, yeah, we we know that we have that feel, right, for those cases that are likely to resolve at a later date. And that doesn't mean counsel can't do it. Just, you know, I always, I always encourage, you know, I, I don't need to send you a bill. Pick up the phone with each other right. and talk. 
um, or if you've been, you know, leaving a um, hearing and you're walking out, you know, have a conversation about the next thing. Do we really need to go and do all of this expert discovery, or should we talk again? Um, and you know, I think the the civility rule, all these things that have, you know, come out recently, I think people are generally uh, getting along better. I think um, Zoom has led to some decorum because people uh, are watching together the same screen, and you know, it's not you're not seeing as much of the drama that you would see at a, at a conference table at a deposition in person that, you know, maybe someone threatens to call the judge or whatever. But when everybody's um, sitting in these forums, um, as we've kind of been accustomed now for the past couple of years, I think the behavior is better. I do try to, you know, determine whether counsel are getting along at the outset. I have been getting a lot of requests for, um, you know, not having joint session, which is a big uh, decision. I think it's it's one where I at least like to have a perfunctory get together, lay down the ground rules for mediation, um, you know, just exchange something that's not as controversial as an opening would be a trial, um, and get to the caucus. But sometimes these things have blown up before. It's a second mediation, and I don't want to set the parties back several hours. So I will you know, let the lawyers decide, but I will acquiesce if that's the decision. And it's becoming more and more popular on the West Coast not to even have the opening the joint session. But uh, I still find it, it works better to just get a look-see at everybody that day. I, I haven't seen that yet in, in my uh, Zoom sessions. I will say that the, the level of civility and professionalism uh, is, uh, well, it's always good, but I think it in it's not as effective to throw down your your legal pad or throw down your pen when you're on Zoom. It doesn't have the same impact, so it's not done. Uh, it, you know, I, it doesn't seem to work. Um, and as far as the joint sessions, I do. Uh, I have some some folks that that want to do just a very cursory. They'll say, well, everybody knows everything. We've done a lot of discovery, so I'm not going to get into a lot. Uh, but I always do my own opening. I feel that that is important for me to kind of lay out the process, how we're going to approach this, I want everybody to know who I am, what my role is, and how I think about the process. I have kind of a three-stage approach to it where I focus on uh, the first goal is, is the information, then we go over to the how much, and then ultimately the, you know, their informed decision, and we'll talk about that some more. Yeah, so let's talk about the process at first from the, uh, the plaintiff's perspective. I know you and I have done both sides of the V, but... Um, why don't you uh, give us your from your mediator's notebook how the how the plaintiff's perspective is? Oh, great. Um, and most of my work is is in the tort field, so I, I work with a lot of adjusters. Uh, a lot of it plays over into the commercial field, also, where you'll have uh, plaintiffs or claimants and respondents in in the commercial setting. Uh, but and I don't mean to say this in a in a derogatory way, but oftentimes I see you know the adjusters. Kind of like you know that that kid. And then let me give you the analogy that I use, and I do use it in in mediation a lot. I, I you know, when I was raising my daughter, when she got her driver's license, I could say, you know, here, honey, here's ten dollars. Go to go to the store, get me milk, bread, and bring me back a change. And you know, truth is, she never brought back change. Um, <laughs> and sometimes, she, and sometimes she'd make a phone call and say, Dad, I need more money. And I go, I don't understand. I, I gave you enough to get the milk and the bread. And, and so, you know, you get a claims representative, or you might get a defendant in a commercial area. They come in, and there's a certain amount that they're willing to pay today. But if they can bring back some change, all the better. Now, from the plaintiff's perspective, you know, what's the goal? And I figure out how much that is. If I figure out what they're willing to pay but don't want to pay, then what what do I need to do to help move that number into a place where, you know, the quintessential, will they make the phone call? Can we turn this, uh, get the defense or the adjuster or whoever's the decision maker on that side to, out of their comfort zone? And, and I, of course, get the plaintiff to come out out of their comfort zone to find that compromise to, to make it work. So th that's the perspectives that I see uh, coming in from the plaintiff uh, processes, what their kind of ultimate, what their initial goals are, at least. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I tend to um, agree that there's a uh, general emphasis on trying to save something off the authority. Um, and it's not always possible because perhaps. Uh, the authority and the valuation coming in, um, you know, wasn't quite 
uh, in line with the damages or something. Um, and I think it really helps folks out there from the plaintiff's perspective uh, to get that demand out before mediation. Um, I don't think that surprises are uh, easy to deal with from a party perspective and from a media's perspective and certainly not from the defense perspective. So if you've worked up your case and you figured out your numbers and uh, you've put something forth at least uh, in a timely manner that will let folks that have that decision-making ability roundtable it discuss the evaluation, bring adequate authority uh, to a mediation. It just helps so much more with um, our efforts, with um, avoiding the frustration. And, you know, it may not be that the case settles, but at least there's something to consider out there that isn't sprung upon them at you know, the opening. Um, and wow. sometimes I don't even get it at the opening. I got to go right. you know, negotiate for the opening uh, demand. So, I don't know if you have anything to add on that art, but I, you know, I think surprises are are frequent and um, and often troublesome. They are detrimental to the process. Um, what I will hear is, uh, are how am I supposed to get more money if I'm just finding out now that there's another you know X amount of dollars in bills or the plaintiff saying, you know, gee, now they show me this this surveillance, but if I would have known that, I, I, I could have, you know, adjusted and we could work with my client. So it doesn't help. I, I am I advocate always for prior proper preparation, get those demands out, have the answers to the key questions, what, what, whatever kind of case it is, whether it's about medical bills, liens, uh, future work with, you know, whatever it is that you may need, get it to the other side in advance. Uh, otherwise, yeah, our task it, our task is much more difficult, and we'll talk about this in a little while because that sometimes leads to well, now we have homework. Uh, we're not going to get it done today, but let's talk about let's create a roadmap. What do we need to do to get back to a real conversation? Exactly. All right, so let's see here. We have um, next slide. So there's a difference, right, between the rooms. Yeah, um, you know, the, the difference between the rooms, uh, we can talk about that. You know, plaintiffs and defendants, uh, they are different. My experience has shown that a uh, plaintiff will come into the room, into the process, and they have a sense of what they want to resolve the case. Um, and it's more of a, you know, they'll know it when they see it. And we were just discussing before on the previous slide, the defense walks in, in quite a different position. They have, they have a number in their pocket. They know what they are willing to pay here. Now, might they adjust it? That's what the process is about. They may decide to keep more of it in their pocket. They may decide to reach deeper. And, you know, that is the uh, you know, one of the big differences, I'll, I'll go into a, a plaintiff's room and uh, part of my, my job is I'm really trying to figure out, do they know what they need? And this was, I think, something uh, that was on a prior slide, but I'll, I'll talk about it some now, is need versus want is a very big uh, aspect of, of my mediation process that I bring to it. And I try and get people to focus on really not what they what they want. What what you want is what you ask from the judge and jury. There's no compromise. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. You get it, you don't always get to keep it. Need is different. Um, and, and I like to use an analogy just real quick on this is, you know, a simple story about a pumpkin. You know, two people want the pumpkin. There's only one pumpkin. Uh, and neither will yield until you discover that, you know, the mediator figures out that what do they need? Well, one's making pumpkin pie and one's carving a jack-o'-lantern. Well, it turns out that once you know what the needs are, well, one pumpkin will do and they, they have compromise. So figuring out what, what is the real need of the plaintiff, um, and, and, we'll, and we can talk about some more of that because there are, there are two different things. Uh, in trial, you know, the plaintiff, you know, the plaintiff wants a home run and the defense usually wants a, a defense verdict. But in real terms, especially in the tort field, what is needed is the plaintiff needs a closing statement that has a net recovery that their client will agree to. The defense needs a release. Um, and that's really what we I try and get 
to folks to focus on because they spend a lot of time focusing on their trial goals and I have to remind them that we're not in trial. If you want your trial goals, you have to go to trial. We're in mediation. So that, that's the need focus is focusing on that. And, and the two rooms are different about that, like I said, because one knows more objectively what they have in their pocket and the other one, you know, the plaintiff doesn't. They, they, they're working towards something else. Do you find sometimes you get to mediation and um, though there have been negotiations prior, um, you're going backwards with maybe a higher demand or less authority, uh, something that uh, nobody anticipated and now the difference is even greater between the rooms because um, we're not continuing the history of the negotiation beforehand. Well, yes. <laughs> Don't look backwards, look forward. Uh, this is a common, this is, I, I've seen this more frequently over the last couple of years, or heard this more frequently. Um, we filed a proposal for settlement for X, but it was done strategically. Our demand is really now you know, three times the proposal for settlement. Or uh, on the defense side, we, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna make a, the opening offer, but it's less than what we had offered previously. And then we have to get into, number one, in terms of process, what kind of reaction are you gonna get from the other side? Uh, in addition to, tell me what's changed, you know, why, why is this happening? And, and when I get that, I, I tend to, whichever room it is that's, that's giving me that message and saying that this is what I wanna take to the, want you to take to the other room, I'll ask them, I'll say, well, let, let me ask you the question, and I, you really don't need to answer, but think about it yourself. Do you think that's going to get you a response that's more favorable or less favorable? And think about that. And if you want me to step out of the room, I'll leave the room, and then you call me back in when you speak to your client. Let's figure out, you know, if that was something, you know, that goes to, to my concept of, you know, manipulation versus capitulation. A lot of times, you know, you'll have counsel say, you know, so we use a plaintiff, for example, again, using the, the difference between the rooms, the plaintiff will say, well, if I, if, I, if I keep on moving down, I'm just capitulating to the defense. And my response is usually, you know, nobody likes to capitulate. That's a, that's a bad feeling. So why don't we just change the vernacular? Let's just change the, change the word. Let's say what you really, what your job is, is to manipulate. You want to get the best possible response from the other room. So manipulation means control. So let's take control and think about whatever your move is, is it going to get a positive or negative response? And let's keep on working towards positive responses. And, you know, I will say to them, if, if you don't get the response that you want, well, you could always pump the brakes. You could always change the topic. You could always change the approach. It's kind of like, you know, and on the defense side, they'll say, well, Art, if I, if I put all that money on the table, you know, I can't get it out. I understand that. It's like making a sauce. You know, once you put the spice in, you can't get it out. But, you know, once you put the spice in, if you don't get the response you want, well, maybe you don't put as much spice in the next time. And uh, and just keep on moving forward, not moving backwards. Moving backwards is very detrimental. All right. Let's look at the issue of rapport. Good issue. Rapport. Let me jump in here on this because I've had some very interesting uh, experiences with rapport uh, over the uh, the Zoom experience. You know, rapport. Uh, th there's different different times in the case. One of the things that I do, I said that I, I look at the the court record or the court docket, and I'm looking for what's in there, what's not in there. Uh, but one of the things that catches my attention always are when I start to see frequent motions for sanctions, motions okay. before the court, and I go, aha, I've got an issue. You know, the first hurdle I have in this, this negotiation is going to be counsel, because they're not, they're not gonna see eye to eye. They, they, they're in transit, they've planted their feet. So that's one of the things that I look for. Have you had any of the, that experience? Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I know troubles ahead. First of all, I know troubles ahead if my office says they can't agree on, you know, what time or where, or Zoom or not Zoom. Or <laughs> so if there's trouble in paradise, it's not going to be the smoothest deal. But, uh, but sure, I, I think, you know, we've all uh, learned to try and build this rapport that we used to build in lobby when someone arrived or, you know, getting a coffee or whatever, you know, and that has changed, obviously, being remote. 
Uh, but I don't think it's impossible. And sometimes um, because you're sitting up close and personal and people are in their own home and you might be able to ask a question about a picture on a bookshelf or there's a pet or something, you know, it, it, it seems like there's Precise. a lot of jumping off points for that. Right. Precisely. I've got, I've got two good examples I want to share on that because rapport between counsel, there's also rapport between the mediator and, and the participants. And, you know, when I'm going from room to room, you know, there has to be a level of trust and it doesn't happen right out of the box all the time. It may be someone I haven't worked with. If I have worked with somebody a lot, we have a different relationship. Uh, we, we already have some trust and rapport built up. But I did have an instance once where I was mediating. We went on for hours and hours. And the truth is, I, I really wasn't getting very far with the, uh, the claims representative. And um, you know, when people come to our office, we learn nothing about them. And they actually don't learn very little about us because they see our offices. But in Zoom, I've discovered that a whole world opens up. So I was talking to him and I was looking in his room and I noticed that there was a guitar in the corner and it was a concert poster on the wall. And so I just changed the subject and I started talking about something that I thought we had in common. He starts about music, his guitar, uh, what he likes, what he doesn't like. And we spent about 10 minutes doing that. When we got done with that conversation, the next comments out was, okay, so what are we going to do about this case? How are we going to move this forward? And everything changed. Um, there was another gentleman it was a, that was in a defense room here. I had a plaintiff's lawyer and he had a picture up on his wall and it was uh, Muhammad Ali when Muhammad Ali was Cassius Clay. And he's, there's a famous photo where he's laying down, the, the Beatles are laying down in front of him. And I asked him about that picture and he says, you know, it's funny, Art, nobody's ever asked me about that picture. And we began to discuss it and he didn't know some things about it, that it was taken in South Beach and Florida down here and when it was taken and who was there. And he learned about that. And then our conversation in that regard, also it opened up. And now it was back to the, okay, how are we gonna move this forward? What do you really need? What are we going to do? And if it wasn't for those little insights, we probably would have been past those cases. So rapport between counsel is important. Rapport between counsel and their clients is important. I get a, a lot of text messages sometimes when I'm mediating, because I always give out my cell number just in case we have uh, communication issues. I want to be able to keep the conversation going and I'll get a little text message saying, Art, I'm having a problem with my client. I need your help. And I'm going, okay, you need to work on that. And, and, and sometimes that becomes the, the focus for a little while to get that in line. So rapport, I think, is important. I think Zoom has given us some opportunities that we didn't have before. Yeah, and the, the issue brought up, um, sometimes I'm getting counsel and client in the same office and they may be on two computers and one is muted um, but a lot of times if there's someone that you know happened to be uh, here in Florida when the incident happened but they don't live here or they're a snowbird or um, you know it's corporate and they're out of town lawyers here so it, it is a little difficult sometimes to have uh, you know the folks that are not present in person uh, get on the same page and even though they're in the breakout room together you know they're not looking at the same um, I don't know piece of evidence or notebook or figure or something and so yeah I think um, it is quite important to keep sort of an awareness of this at all times and uh, try to be helpful where you can and try to you know give people power to share screens and things like that right. uh, and uh, I just at first was very uh, skeptical about whether we would be able to do it and a couple of years in here now I think that it's it's as good or better some like you're saying you know more about the person uh, because they're in their own environment yeah and share you said something about screen sharing sharing evidence is very important and it's you can facilitate it much faster on zoom because people show up to mediation live and they go oh, well that those documents are in my office here they go oh, wait a second let me just bring it up on screen and show you and all of a sudden, there's you know something important is being shared. Here's another little practical thing that you know I, I think our our attendees may want to keep in mind, and I see it uh, fairly often. And that is when I leave the room and when I come back in, and we know that Zoom hasn't given us a doorbell, so I pop into the room and I always say, you know, I'm in the room and I'm sure to step on someone's conversation. But too often, I see that counsel and client have closed their cameras and muted themselves. So they're actually as though they're not in the same room. Right. And it makes me, I get the sense that 
that's a problem in the process because now they're actually not communicating with each other from the client's perspective especially if it's not an adjuster or a professional but a lay person you know like in a plaintiff's personal injury case I, I, I oftentimes wonder how do they feel when their lawyer basically just walked out of the room on them versus keeping them in and then they tell me Art, I have a client control issue and I think well you just walked out on them if you stay in there and you keep talking you can you can keep the rapport and not lose it so I encourage people if you can don't don't close those cameras uh, don't mute yourself your your clients may think gee what's wrong with me why, why are you leaving me and the rapport is, is lost that's a good point. And I, I think we uh, at the ADR section of the Florida Bar even heard some anecdotal stuff a while back about people blacking out their cameras, even in openings or um, just showing up in the phone. And, you know, it's it, if someone's there, they attended. But I really prefer it if at least at the outset we get to look at everybody, um, get a feel for that person. And then in the caucus, likewise, if we if we have uh, black screens and people are doing um, you know, multi multitasking, doing other work, um, understanding that everybody's busy, but keeping the focus on the negotiation is really important. And, you know, losing uh, any momentum that, you know, some intervening thing that we can't see is happening uh, is not helpful to the process. So, um, you know, as, as a section, we decided we weren't going to go uh, try to require that, but we wanted to make people aware that it is, is an unhelpful situation when uh, folks don't seem to be fully participating. All right, let's go to the next slide here. So perception, Art, very important. Yeah, perception. Well, perception is reality. Um, and th there's some technical th areas here. I mean, you know, I oftentimes ask when I am in say, the defense room, uh, I'll say to the attorney, I said, well, you know, you, you took the plaintiff's uh, deposition yeah so let's talk about that how they do uh and then you know give me give me your insights and sometimes they'll say well look i don't think they're going to present well but other times i'll hear you know what are they did pretty nice they did well and i want the adjuster to hear that you know because it becomes an important part of the assessment and i do remind folks all the time as i did in my trial practice that over the judge's bench all throughout the state of florida it says we who labor here seek the truth and, uh, you know, really it ought to say we who labor here seek the perception of truth because, let's face it, it's either the jury or the judge's perception that becomes the truth of the case. And, you know, perception is reality. In my openings, I always I have a couple of things that I do. Uh, one is I, I hold up a, a bottle of water. It's not the same bottle of water. It doesn't turn on me. It's fresh. It keeps me hydrated. But I always hold up a bottle of water. It's, I always drink half of it in advance. And and I, and I say, you know, if I ask the advocates what they see, you know, one might tell me it's half full, one they say it's half empty. If I bring a third in, they may say it's full, half air, and half water. They're all correct, and but they're all different. And I also hold up a piece of paper with a, a two gentlemen fighting over a number, and it's a six or a nine. Depends on which way you look at it. And, you know, I, I make the point that there's going to be different perceptions of what you really, and I say to them, what you want to discuss with your attorney and your client when you're in caucus, when you're in private, you want to ask if the judge or jury gets to hear, if you don't settle this, if they get to hear how the other advocate presents their client's perception, how might that affect the decision maker's perception? Because that's going to ultimately affect their decision. And so perception to me becomes really one of the most important things that we do because ah, we're not going to convince each room to suddenly say, oh yes, you're right. But they can understand that the perceptions can really drive the decision maker's decision. And if that perception, you know, that's a big question mark. And we could talk about that too, you know, the, you know, the verdict form. I also hold those up. I've got a, ver a piece of paper that says verdict and it's got a big question mark on it. And I, and I say to the folks, I go, you know, nobody here is gonna fill this out and it's gonna be filled out by those six people. And do you know what their perception is going to be? And you're not until they fill it out and sign it, and then it's too late. That's why there's a question mark. And I hold up another piece of paper and it says settlement, and it's got a big check mark on it. And you know, that's the one where I say, you know, this is this one is control. That's you, you, you take the you take somebody else's potential perceptions out of the mix. And most of the mediation concepts that I focus on are about maintaining control, ways to maintain control and not acquiesce. Yeah, that that definitely is a 
a visual that helps. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it can be intimidating the whole process to somebody uh, that's been it maybe explained to it by counsel, but now they're here and they're living through it and they uh, really might not understand the consequences of, um, you know, the ability to fashion your own resolution and self-determination versus have an arbitrary finding by a court or a jury. So uh, that, that reminder is something to use. All right, so we're on a playing field, Art. Yeah, and <laughs> you know, over time, I've I've come up with different thoughts and analogies uh, about these things. Um, and you know, there's the playing field is is truly that are we are, are we really having the, the important conversation? You know, is there tension between the parties? Are we getting close? And so I, I use a couple of analogies i'm not i'm not much of a golfer if you were to see me playing golf you I get up on the tee you would say I'm, I'm facing the wrong way but if you ever saw my slice you'd realize that i'm not so if, I, if i face left i'm gonna i'm gonna hit the, the ball down the fairway but um you know there there's the analogy i say you know we drive for show and putt for dough um and, you know, what is the the meaning of that in, in the mediation conference you know the, the initial moves and i and i often say it's not important where we start when people have a big you know if they go first do the, who goes next and i would say well it doesn't matter where we start is not nearly as important as where we end and right now each room is just kind of taking their shots across the bow feeling out the other side trying to get a sense for things and so you know that's the driver show it looks nice when you hit the ball and it goes way down the fairway but there's no no games are won down there. You got to get on the green. That's where the that's where the cup is. And so and I tell them so if we're going to drive for show. But you know when I get when I feel like we're getting onto that green, I say folks, I think think we found the green. Now psychologically, if we're talking about dollars being moved back and forth, there's perhaps a little psychological aspect to that too. Since but uh, you know that's where we have to find ourselves on that green. Um, and there's there's other concepts here. Um, that, that and truly a lot of this outline was just my notes over the last five years. I keep a, a list of all the different things I bump into, little things I use in mediation, uh, and that's why this is you know the the mediator's notes become the the, you know, the litigator's toolbox um, because there are things like uh, final offers or demands. Uh, some folks like to say, "Are why don't we send over? We'll fill it out and send it to the other room." I haven't had a lot, I don't know about you, Lawrence, I haven't had a lot of success with that. Uh, what I've had is sometimes the other room just fills out their own and sends it back. Um, <laughs> it doesn't really get us anywhere. Um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, it could be effective, but if it's going to be things like that, if you're, if you're gonna be effective, then you have to fill, then you fill it out and you say, but this is it, this is final. And now you're, now you're looking at it. If it's final, you better mean it. <laughs> you're gonna lose yeah. credibility. Yeah, you lose credibility, uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, we're getting close, um, you know, we're almost out or whatever. Those kind of things are, are fine. I I do find, um, you know, and if it's even five more grand, some people are not going to do it because they've already said it was the end. Um, and it's silly to, to not settle a case over a small amount. But uh, but understanding that you've made that uh, a hard line, you don't want to then, you know, undermine your credibility. No, I, I actually, uh, when I when I'm not sure about the message I'm being given to send, I, I always restate it uh, to make sure I I've got clarity. And I'll say, are you telling me? Because they'll say this is it. Or, this is what I want to pay. And they'll, but they won't actually use the word final. So I'll say, are you are you telling me that this is your final number? Is this going to be it? And that's where I'll get the well, you know, I don't know. But look, I, 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 that's when you get the, I don't have a lot more room. I'm running out of runway. The scuba tank is getting low on it. You know, all of the different metaphors that we use in here. And I'll say, okay, I won't do that. But final should mean final. Or if it's not gonna be final, then there's gotta be a darn good reason to change it. And I, I have some stories about things that have happened with that. Uh, one quick one I'll, I'll say is uh, I had someone fill out a, the, the the settlement agreement and have me send it over to the other room we were doing this was a live mediation a couple of years back before COVID and it was told Art you go in there and you tell the insurance company this is it final it's filled out it's signed that's it 
And then they wandered off to the coffee room, went out to the restroom, did what they were going to do, and they came back. And the room was empty where the adjuster and defense lawyer was. And so where'd they go? So they impassed. Why? You said that you're not going to go. You're done. This was final. And that's not their number. Well, they were in the hallway. And they said, Art, I'm not coming back in. They said what they said, and that's going to be it. I can tell you that we negotiated as that adjuster drove from Miami to Tampa. We negotiated all the way across, getting them back in the, into the process, so to speak. And we settled it in his driveway, yeah. um, but we walked away. And so yeah. I do, do remind people, be very careful with the language. Again, going back to our early slides, there is a, you know, there's a process and there's a language in our process and words matter. They do it that, and uh, yeah, never let them leave if you can. <laughs> so some of the tools uh, that you have here, uh, most patient person at mediation gains the most. I like that one. Yeah, uh, always. Um, it, it is, I will say, I did a recent mediation, and it did impasse. And there was, you know, one room was was being inpatient, and I, I think that, you know, it would have probably resolved. And I, I had another one where somebody became inpatient and they walked out of the room. And as they were walking out, they said, and I'm going to file a proposal for settlement for this amount of money. And they left. And I, and I tried to come on back. Let's talk. Let's, 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 we'll get the, let's just keep the conversation going. And they left. And then the other attorney turned around. It was the defense attorney turned around to me and says, well, Art, but that's how much I have. Well, the case settled when the proposal for settlement was filed, but uh, you know the lack of the lack of uh, of patience uh, really led to at that day uh, an impasse. So I think that's important. People that as a mediator, I think that's an important skill that we have to have. That's kind of that therapist hat that we put on sometimes, getting folks to take a deep breath and settling back in and understanding. You know, the process is. Back to my dance analogy in the beginning, uh, Lawrence, uh, you know, the parties are doing a dance. And here's the problem. One wants to do a cha-cha and the other one wants to do a tango. And that's how they, that's their process. That's what they're comfortable with. And one gets frustrated with the other. How do we get them to reconcile? And sometimes I have to just say to the other room, I go, look, you know, the person over there that's that's controlling, say, the checkbook or something, this is this is how they like to move. So Again, you're not capitulating. Let's let's manipulate it a little bit. Go with it. Let's slow it down. Let's move through the process. They have to be comfortable, and if they're comfortable and you can get there, then we're going to find that happy place where we can resolve. I see you have another one about um, past moves, and when people, you know, when you get frustrated and people start matching moves or moving incrementally. Um, you know, what are your what are your tools that get past those kind of ruts? Well, <laughs> match moves. Well, first thing I do is it, I get we get that a lot, right? I'll, I'll go up ten, I'll go down ten, um, and I'll I'll, I'll kind of let it go. And sometimes I'll say to one room or the other, I said, okay, uh, looks like we're falling into a pattern. All right, what do we do? I said, well, let's test it. Let's see if there's a pattern here. Make a move. See if they match. They match. Knowledge becomes power, right? It's control. So I said, now, if we know that they're going to do a match move, and I said, yeah, Art, but I can't match them to the middle. I said, all right, then we need to change the process. Let's change it up. Change your number, or maybe that's when I say, you want to try a bracket. Do you want to do something else and see if we can break the pattern? Or are we, in fact, learning something from the pattern? So, you know, these processes or here's a terrible one. That move is not good enough. Try again. I'm not going to move. Yeah. Have you ever heard that, Lawrence? Yeah, or like when you get caught up in brackets, which I think we'll talk about later. But yeah, what, whose move is it? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, let's see. I have another. I have something else up here about uh, you know the lawyer who represents themselves has a fool for for a client. You know, and, and really, I I have that in here because uh, you know lawyers and advocates. They really do need to, you know, embrace their client's case and you live with a case for, you know, years. Uh, sometimes it's hard to, to see past those blinders and, uh, you know, the, the lawyers have to help their clients. 
And I think the mediator has to help the, the advocates uh, see past those blinders because they do come in kind of revved up and they fully embrace and they're not able to see very clearly the other perspectives or the other possible perceptions. So focusing on pragmatism. All right, here's some more. Yeah, case value. Go ahead. <laughs> See at the bottom midpoints, that's always one. But go ahead. Yeah, what about valuation of cases? Yeah, well, you know, valuation of cases, this is something I do talk about in, in my openings also. I, I say there's really two values to a case. You know, there's there's you know what what you'll get from a judge or jury. And I do focus them on, you know, you might get it, you might not. If you get what you ask for, you might not keep it. Um, and then there's you know, and that's the want, what you want, and then there's the need. Uh, and you know. Ultimately, in mediation, a case is not worth, as it says, you know, a penny more than someone's willing to pay or a penny less than someone's willing to accept. And the question is, are we going to figure that out? Um, but, but going back down to, as I think it is important as, as we're watching our time, brackets and midpoints. Uh, you were going to say something about midpoints. That, 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 that is always a very interesting facet of the process that we engage in. So... Do you find an overemphasis on it? Do you find a calculation based on midpoints of midpoints? Do you find that um, even when you caution people not to look at them, um, you know, it's better to lean into them <laughs> so that everybody knows exactly what's going on? What's your strategy with, with when those become uh, sort of a prominent factor at a point in negotiation? Great, I, you know, I, I, I think midpoints matter. Um, I always liken it to, you know, people sometimes will say and tell them don't look at the midpoint. Uh, I, I think of it, you know, I don't remember what movie it was or what it is, but it's like, say you're going to meet someone and they say, you know, when you meet, when you meet Joe, don't look at his nose. He's got a big mole on his nose. Well, when Joe walks in the room, the first place you look is at his nose. It's inevitable. So when somebody says, don't look at the midpoint, the first thing I hear is why, what's the midpoint? Um, I think midpoints matter. I think that we should be aware of them. The participants should be and I like to kind of get an idea and these come up a lot you know not only I do what I do track the midpoints even outside of brackets I'm always watching it uh, and I try and figure out based on the party's moves is the number that they moved to going up or down based upon a true number that they want or are they really manipulating the midpoint because if they're manipulating the midpoint for example someone doesn't move a lot and the other room says, gee, they didn't go down that much. I said, yeah, but you know what? Let's look at it a different way because they get frustrated. And I said, well, well maybe, maybe we're looking at the wrong number. The last three moves seem to be really important about making sure that midpoint never goes above or below a certain number. Could it be that that's really the message they're sending you? And then we can test it, you know, change, change your number. Let's try a bracket. Let's do something. So I do think midpoints, midpoints matter. And I've had some experiences where folks... In, in, the, in the bracket world, and we'll talk about those, have made some some mis mistakes, or maybe we I made the mistake by not making sure everybody was really playing by the same rules. What is a non-bracket bracket? <laughs> non-bracket bracket. I think they're they're they can be used sometimes in, in instances, uh, but they sound like this. Uh, somebody will say, uh, as it says there, uh, Art, I'll 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 raise my my offer to. Uh, to 10, but but they have to be at three, um, you know, or to use bigger numbers, you know, I'll go to I'll go to 50,000, but they have to be under six digits. But don't look at the midpoint. I'm not between 50 and 100. I'm just saying that uh, they got to be down there. Now, it can be used and sometimes it's used where you're not getting anywhere. And someone says, you know what, I just want to I want to send the message that we're not going to be up in their area. Or we're not going to be down in their area. And we want to cut to the quick. We want to get that out there. And so that's the what I call the non-bracket bracket, where they send some type of a message. Me, I prefer if you're going to do that, I try to lean people towards, well, let's give us a bracket because brackets have certain rules that we can work by or understandings. Uh, and that's what the non-bracket bracket is, is this people saying, all right, they've been in the six digits all afternoon and we're not going to be there. So if their next number isn't, you know, 99 or below, then we're probably not going to get this done. So the message is really, we're not in that number and vice versa. That's the non-bracket bracket. And they usually say, don't look at that midpoint because they're they're not really focusing on that. They're just trying to get someone 
up to a range or out of a range. So we're talking bracketology and it's not March Madness. Um, <laughs> the idea of uh, getting out of that, what I sometimes call bracket hell, where you've gotten a counter bracket and then there's another one and then you kind of lost track of you know whose actual turn was it and then everybody gets scared about going again because now they've had some idea of ranges um how do you recenter the folks after something of that episode where a, a, no bracket has been accepted but there have been a series of counter brackets well in addition to watching the midpoints the midpoints of the midpoints i look at some other things on brackets you know th it's not a rule but statistically, I have found <clears throat> that subconsciously, perhaps, maybe consciously, there's, you know, in a bracket, as it shows up here, uh, the plaintiff, uh, actually, it's on another, another sheet. I'm going to jump past that. But, you know, the, the, the plaintiff will look at uh, the bottom, the, uh, the top of a defense bracket, and the, and the defendant will look at the bottom of a plaintiff's bracket and say, well, why would they do that? Sometimes it turns out that they're projecting, you know, the top number or the bottom number where one room or the other room is willing to go, uh, and not so much the midpoint. That will call into uh, anchoring, where one number is anchored. For example, uh, the plaintiff will anchor uh, a top number. You know, they'll put 250 at the top, and they'll their bottom number is at 100, and they won't move the 250. They'll just go 100, 125, 150, and they're closing the gap. On the defense side, they may do the opposite. They'll, they may anchor 100 and go, you know, and they start bringing their number down. If you go plaintiff to 250, I'll go to 100. If you go to, you know, just squeeze it down. Now, if the rooms start to do that, I'm learning something. So I can start having conversations with the parties about, you know, what does that mean? And I'll ask them, what do you, what do you think is happening? What, do you think they're sending you a message? What is that message? Um, looking at the screen, there's something else I wanted to jump into here, which is uh, you know, plaintiff and defendants uh, in terms of their negotiations, talking about numbers. Sometimes they're not, there's not a reality to what's really happening. For example, a plaintiff may be making demands and I'll have to say, well, let's look at the verdict form. You know, let's, let's fill it out. This is your past medicals. This is, uh, there's no future medicals there's this lost earning or there's no lost earning capacity. Um, but you're asking for X amount of dollars. How does how do you reconcile that with what the reasonable outcome is in front of a jury? And does that mean that maybe your numbers are not right? Maybe you need to look at that. And no, I let them figure it out. And sometimes they'll say, well, yeah, I kind of see what, what you're saying. And I said, well, let's figure that, what, what that looks like and see if that doesn't drive the, the negotiation. On the defense side, there's another piece of paper that needs to be focused on. I'll, I'll get a, a defendant, uh, whether it's commercial matter or, 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 or a tort matter, and they'll say, Art, this is good money. I don't understand why this won't settle the case. And I'll say, let's just put up then on Zoom. It's nice. I would put up the whiteboard and I'll say, let's go ahead and do a closing statement. There's the, the amount you want to pay. Let's take off the contingency fee. Let's take off the medical bills, whatever the reduced amount is in the cost. Look at the, the number on the bottom. That's the net recovery to client. I said, I don't need an answer. You, you just ask yourselves, talk in private. Do you think the plaintiff in the other room is going to sign off on that? Well, I don't know. I don't think so, Art. I said, well, if you don't think so, then maybe our goal for today is in settlement <laughs> or you don't have enough money. If it's not going to be settlement, let's figure out why the plaintiff is looking for that number or what we need to do to close that gap. And that becomes homework for the future. And that, that's that continuing process that we get into where, you know, knowing the goals and being willing to, to shift up and, you know, switch over to, well, it's not this goal for today, but there, but it doesn't mean we're, we're at a loss. We, we can still have a productive process that leads to a settlement in the future. So that's the pointing out inconsistencies in fact and, you know, what are you really working towards and work through the important documents. So new, I see we have a change screen there. Yeah, I think that leads into your best and worst outcomes and, you know, what, what you might change. And, um, and those, yeah, those um, figures on closing statements and, and verdict forms, are they're hard. Yeah, they are. And, uh, you know, these are some of the things I, I try and focus people on, you know, don't change the past. You can't change the past. I mean, we've all tried to change the past. We can't focus on the future. Uh, reality checks, things like, uh, you know, the big picture 
how much is it going to cost, inconsistencies in fact. Uh, these are all the, the, the little things that come up all throughout a mediation that I think we as mediators, that's in our toolbox that we have to always bring out to the clients and help them understand so that they can work with their clients uh, to move things forward. Role reversal is, is sometimes tricky because it's hard to get people, but you can get people to think about and, and look, in, look at things from the other side. Uh, it doesn't happen too often, but sometimes we can do that and that could be helpful. And you have a few more here. Um, yeah, well, here's, you know, skipping past, past and future, which we've been talking about, steps and costs if no resolution. That's actually pretty powerful. I've used that a lot. Right. You know, and, I, and I'll just simply ask the parties, you know, I, in the defense room, I'll, I'll ask trial counsel, I'll, I'll ask the advocate, I'll say, well, you know, maybe what you need to discuss is if we don't resolve today, your adjuster wants to know, you know, I said, I don't know, but I bet they're going to ask you the following question. You know, what's, what's the trial budget going forward? And, you know, if the answer to the question is, if we put that money on the table today, will this case settle? Because if you spend that money, did it get you, you know, does the question mark on the verdict form go away? Does it buy you any more certainty? Um, and, and the same on the plaintiff side. If you don't resolve today uh, as your costs go up, and if the evaluation in the other room doesn't change, is your net recovery proportionately going down? So maybe we need to think about that today versus posturing to see if we can't get the case resolved. Yeah, and I do believe everything. I'm sorry, I was going to say, and I do believe everything that you know, and that's the nice part about being a neutral is uh, I believe everything that everybody tells me. The only question is, uh, you know, how do we get the other side to agree or disagree? You know, to agree with you. You were about to say something. I didn't mean to. Uh, to overstep you, sir. There, Lawrence? Sorry, there was a plane buzzing. My house. Ah, <laughs> got it. Didn't... We didn't hear it. No, it didn't come through. You, your uh, your sound suppression worked perfectly. All right. Uh, yeah, you know, I believe everything you said. Well, you know, I mean, you're always going to get people talking past each other. That's why they hire us, right? Um, but yeah, just to um, try and look at the process as it evolves over, you know, perhaps several hours and things that you learn and, and there's sometimes, sometimes a perspective shift. Um, people are generally on, you know, a path um, and we kind of tweak that path as we go. Um, and I think that, you know, as you've laid this out in your tools on the playing field, that kind of thing, it's, um, it's important that you have all this at your disposal. You don't need all of it, right? So you're kind of, you know, reaching for this at this time and helping the attorney at that time and trying to get somebody, a uh, party interested in uh, the same idea as their attorney has suggested. And, the, you know, it's, it's uh, as you said, a complicated dance, but I think these are, are very helpful. Or, or, and uh, just to uh, let folks know, this will be available uh, when you get your uh, email about having attended. Um, so don't worry if you're, you know, uh, not taking notes, we have this for you. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. Sure. I like the first line. <laughs> or shoes and hand grenade. <laughs> well, it's only counted. Uh, I, you know, that's, uh, and it's true. Close only counts in hand, horseshoes and hand grenades, and mediation is neither. It's like you know we're close, but we have to we have to close that gap completely and try and get it done. Uh, and and part of that goes back to my focus of you know the most important piece of paper. Here's something that I try and bring to you know I like imagery, so I will talk to each room and I'll say you know what, bring yourself because they're all working with trial lawyers. I said bring yourself into the courtroom, and you see yourself sitting there at the end of this case, and you hear the knock on the door and the jury's got a verdict, and you take a piece of paper, it's the, your copy of the verdict form, and you slide it in front of you, and you take your pen, hover over it. I said, nobody ever fills it out in advance. Why? So that's uncertainty. And that's what we're here to get rid of. Why have that, that piece of paper with all that uncertainty? Because that's the most important piece of paper in a case at trial, but here in mediation, the best piece of paper is that settlement agreement. You get to fill it out. And in an earlier slide, uh, there was something about buy. You know, every, there's always a little bit of buyer's remorse. I mean, 
I never settled the case that my wife didn't know if I settled or didn't settle. And it sounds a little counterintuitive. I come home and if I had a frown on my face, she'd say, you settled. And the reason for that was, you know, you always question for your client. Did I do the right thing? Did I guide them in the right way? If I had a big smile, she was like, well, you guys were so far apart, it was easy. The idea is you got to get close. You have to have that tension. And uh, I like to focus people in, in their mediation. Question marks on the verdict form, check marks on the settlement agreement. Let's close the gap. Let's get it done. Yeah, I agree with all of that. All right, let me, uh, your next slide has the homework piece you were talking about earlier. So. Um, so we didn't quite get done, but what it, what is some of the things that you suggest on the way out and, uh, you know, want folks to do more for their case? Well, sometimes it's as simple as you need to take a deposition or someone saying their doctor is going to say this or that and someone is unsure about it, go take that depo. Sometimes it's a hearing. A motion for summary judgment that, frankly, is just an impediment until it's heard and ruled upon. There's not going to be a real conversation. Now, that's in another piece of paper with a question mark. And sometimes folks don't want to have it heard, but it's not been set for hearing. And so you get that set for hearing. Or, uh, you know, those are the types of little things, discovery, uh, sharing of additional evidence, setting down important depositions, getting hearings on the calendar getting a trial date. Uh, this is the homework that has to be done. And then, you know, what I'll do is I'll look for, you know, I'll diary out a 30 days, 60 days, I'll put it in my own calendar and then I'll reach out and I'll check the doc and I'll reach out. So it says, what's happened here? Has this been done? Did you get those medicals to the other side? The defense, did you get the defense medical examination done? Uh, because until then, sometimes people are just reluctant to have a, a real conversation. And that's, you know, going to mediation and not really being fully ready. So homework is, to me is hope. It, it means that we have something to talk about in the future. What are you seeing as far as trial dates? I mean, I have folks that say, you know, they're on the docket and, you know, then I say, well, what number are you on the docket? You know, well, we're number 20. Okay, well, you know, we have a million case backlog that, you know, they're catching up with uh, around the state, but uh, uh, is that even a threat anymore? Um, and, and on the other hand, I've, I've had several colleagues have told me they've been in trial recently and, you know, wasn't expected and they went, they were pushed to do it. So what, I mean, is it something that people can use as, you know, the impetus to get the case done? Uh, well, I, I will say that um, between live mediations and uh, Zoom mediations, I think the, the, the impasse uh, settle rate is about the same. Right after COVID hit, there was a, a weird flux where at first there was a lot of settlements and then there were much fewer because few people knew they were not going to go to trial. What I'm having now here in this, because we're in Florida, there's a you know, Supreme Court administrative order. Uh, for example, in Dade County, you don't have to ask for a trial date. You're going to get a case management order and the judge is going to give you a trial date. And you may be number 100 on a docket, but there's no continuances. They're not giving out those continuances and you can get sent over to, an admin, to, a, to another backup judge and it's keeping people's feet to the fire. I will say that there's a problem with that in, in that it's creating, I see the, the look on my, our clients' faces. I see a lot of anxiety. Uh, I hear people talking about Art, I, I can't I can't even properly prepare. The defense medical examiners are not available and I'm missing deadlines. Uh, we're not able to get certain discovery done. So it's a plus and a minus. But right now, I think a lot of the people I work with, they're, they're looking at those trial dates and they're taking them very serious, no matter what their case number is or how many other cases may be on that docket. Yeah, I think as, as case management has been used as a tool to get that backlog under control. And it looks more federal in nature uh, with tracks and timeframes. Uh, in addition to what we're seeing in many jurisdictions, the introduction of the non-binding arbitration, uh, the, the, then following that a move for trial de novo, operating as a PFS of sorts. So I think uh, those those are developments that have you know, lent the judiciary some tools to get the dockets under control and that are unfamiliar to people uh, that generally participate in mediation and then you know know when their 
generally trying the case. And so uh, we'll see what happens with those. But yeah, the threat of um, being on the dock, it's, it depends really, doesn't it, on the locality and what's happening uh, in that jurisdiction. I know you wanted to talk about um, multi-defendant cases and um, some of the, the differences between just a two-party case. So I thought it would give a chance for uh, people to hear your perspective on that as well. Great. Thank you, Lawrence. This, this is an area, I, I do a fair amount of multi-party, multi-defendant cases, and, and they seem to have their, their own unique challenges. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you that one of the pitfalls is when the defendants have not really spoken with each other and you show up at mediation, you've got two or three different defendants sitting in different rooms, and we spend the first hours with the following conversation. Uh, I'm not going to pay more percentage than the other defendant. Um, I'm just the icing on the cake or the sprinkles on it. I'm not the main guy. Uh, and what happened, what my response on some of those is, well, you want to pay only 25% of what? We don't even know what the numbers are going to be. How can we do that? So if you want to be more effective, and I encourage our participants here to think about it, if you're going to be involved and there's multiple defendants, Number one, it's helpful if we can have, even with the mediator, a pre-mediation mediation, get all the defendants, figure out, are we going to be in one room or separate? What are the relationships? Is there contractual relationships? Does one have a duty to defend and indemnify over the other? Have they gone ahead and tendered the defense and was it refused? Do we have a defendant that's going to say, well, the other defendant owes me $30,000 in fees already, so, you know, we want to make sure that we're going to get paid. Uh, all of these things is their common law, contractual indemnity, you know, very different. Um, and is there an ongoing business relationship? And this, this is not just in, in the in the tort area. This will also be when you have in a commercial area where you've got either a two-party or a multi-party, multi-defendant uh, construction defect or something where you'll discover, well, after today, you're all still going to be working together. How are we going to you know, get through this process and save that relationship? So anytime we have multiple defendants, I try as hard as I can in advance of mediation to learn as much as possible, maybe talk to them, maybe have a pre-mediation mediation. Because what happens is if you spend all that time bantering back and forth between the defendants, and you don't engage the plaintiff. When you finally start bringing over the first dollars, you've already lost the plaintiff and they're frustrated. So when that has happened, I've said to the defendants, now that we either have one pool of money, because uh, you can't even do brackets if everybody's operating individually. Another thing that'll happen is they'll say to me, Art, I don't know, I don't want the other defendant to know what we're offering, but we also just want to make sure that the, all the defendants, it's a global offer. And, you know, uh, my response is, well, you're going to get an answer or response from the plaintiff, but how do you know how to measure it? If, if neither room knows what we just sent to the plaintiff. So these are, you know, knowing how we're going to do this, are they going to be global offers, individual offers, and the plaintiff need to know, will the plaintiff potentially settle with one defendant or the other? If there's one defendant that wants to settle, but they know that they're just going to get pulled right back in the case because there's a cross claim or they're going to be sued for indemnity, then they can't settle. So these are a lot of the moving parts and they can complicate things uh, on the multi-defendant cases. So I do encourage people Think about it well in advance of mediation. Who are the players? If you're a plaintiff, uh, reach out to the mediator and, and, and tell the mediator that you know there are these defendants. We've been going through discovery. They're definitely not in lockstep. Or if you're on the defense side, reach out to the mediator and say, you know, we we would do better to be uh, united than to be uh, divided and conquered. Uh, and so. Those are, those are my little thoughts and tips as we come to the end of this on the multi-defending cases. Uh, there's unique aspects in many different types of cases, but this is one that I see uh, gets turned sidewards uh, too often when there hasn't been enough pre-planning. Yeah, I think it's important to get, um, you know, at least ranges uh, from lesser players to understand if there's cross claims, third party claims and things of that nature, how they're going whether there's symbolic, whether there's coverage, whether there's uh, sometimes there's counsel for the carrier and there's personal counsel and all these things. So um, it's it's very um, important to kind of map it out. And then I like to just try and make sure 
those people aren't left hanging from the main defendant during the day because I might meet with everybody at the outset and then we start to caucus and then those people get frustrated because they haven't seen me in an hour or two. So I always, between moves, try to pop back in, um, just tell them it's moving, find out something if I can, you know, pose a question about something. If it's a construction case, you know, tell me more about those windows or tell, tell me about that roof or, you know, something where I can um, inject a little bit of uh, participation and, and make sure they know that we're out there earning our money art. <laughs> You're, that that's a good point, and it is very easy to forget that 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 party that's in that room, and then you're gone for too long. Um, that that is that is uh, a key a key factor uh, in, in keeping people uh, surprised and happy and part of the process. I also in Zoom, I set up multiple rooms for that. Also, I have breakout yes. rooms. I always set up depending on how many parties. There, I always have an extra mediator room. Sometimes I have two or three of them. So that I can move people around and we could have these, these little private conferences. Precisely. All right, folks, we're right at 220 and we want to make sure you make the most of your day. So we're giving you the CLE number from the Florida Bar 2201757N. 2201757N. And thank you for joining Art and myself in this conversation about our mediator toolbox that became the attorney's toolbox. So the basically uh, we'll have these um, from time to time. The next one's in May, and it's on mass torts. So look out for announcements about that. And as I said, uh, always, if you go to our Upchurch Watson website, there's a whole uh, battery of these uh, banked for you to uh, take advantage of for either CLE or CME as you self-report. And the uh, expiration dates are listed there as well. And um, I always uh, blog on something called Orlando Mediator. So if y'all want to learn more about mediation arbitration. Uh, this is my, I think, 12th year blogging on Orlando Mediator. So just Google it and you'll find it. And Art, thanks, that was really informative. Thank you, Lonzo, I enjoyed it. Pleasure. Have a great weekend, everybody.